Good morning. Uh, today we're going to investigate a special technique that can be used to derive derivatives uh, where we bypass the limit definition of the derivative. What we're going to use is uh, composition of functions in addition to our knowledge of the chain rule. So um, I'd like to start with the abstract version of what we're going to do and then we'll see how this works through several examples. So let's say I'm trying to find the derivative of some inverse function. I'm looking for a shortcut for that derivative. Well, we know that f composed with f inverse of x is just x because the inverse function undoes the original function. Let me take the derivative of both sides. Well, if I do that, then I get f prime of f inverse of x times the derivative of the inside guy. So that's the chain rule. And that's going to equal 1 because that's the derivative of x. Well, I can now solve for this. So we have that the derivative of f inverse of x is 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. So if I know f, which uh, hopefully I do because I'm looking for the inverse, and if I know f inverse, and I can compute the derivative of f, then I get as a bonus the derivative of the inverse function as well. So this is admittedly abstract. Uh, let's see how this works in a particular example so that we can see how powerful this concept is. Again, the concept is I know the derivative of f, I don't know the derivative of f inverse, but I can use the derivative of f um, to find the derivative of f inverse. So for the first example, let's look for the derivative of the natural log of x. Okay, so the way that this process worked again is I knew the derivative of the outside function, I composed it with something, and I got x. So we know that the inverse function of the natural log is e to the x. And we also know that e to the natural log of x then is x. So why am I starting it like that? Because I'm looking for this guy's derivative. I don't know this guy's derivative. But I do know the derivative of e to stuff. And I do know the derivative of x. Since I know the derivative of e to stuff, don't know this guy, and I do know this guy's derivative, this tells me that I'll be able to derive the derivative of the inverse function, namely the derivative of the natural log of x. So how do we do it? We just took the derivative of both sides. So we have e to the ln of x times the derivative of ln of x. Again, that's the chain rule. And this is what I'm trying to solve for. And the derivative of x is 1. So we have that the derivative of ln of x is 1 over e to the ln of x. That's correct, but we never write it like this because um, uh, we take advantage of the composition. We're uh, composing this. And once again, it's just x on bottom then. So we get that the derivative of the natural log is 1 over x. This is fantastic. We've now come up with a new technique to come up with a derivative shortcut that doesn't involve the limit definition. And we can employ this technique if we know the derivative of the outer, outer, outer uh, function, we don't know the derivative of the inner function, and we compose it into something that we can actually handle. So let's look at another example. Um, let's say I'm looking for the derivative of a to the x. Well, um, this we know the answer. It's a to the x ln of a, but I never proved this uh, particular shortcut. So let's uh, let's see where that's coming from. Um, I'm going to play the same game. I don't know the derivative of a to the x. I do know the derivative of ln of stuff, and this, by properties of logs, is x ln of a. So this isn't exactly like this, 
because I'm not proposing a function and its inverse, but it's still the same idea, which is I know this guy's derivative, I'm composing it with something whose derivative I don't know, I know this guy's derivative. So uh, pause the video, see if you can uh, play the same game that uh, I played in this first um, derivation to find the derivative of a to the x. Right, hopefully you gave it a shot, you took derivative, the derivative of both sides, the derivative of the natural log of stuff, we have one over stuff, time the derivative of that stuff. Again, we don't know, you know, in quotes, we don't know the derivative of a to the x, so I'll just write it like that. So one over stuff times the derivative of that stuff. The derivative of x ln a is just ln of a because this is just like 10x. Um, it's just linear, so the derivative is going to be that guy's slope, which is ln of a. And then we can multiply both sides by a to the x, and we get the formula that we've been using. The derivative of a to the x is a to the x times the natural log of a. All right, the next uh, two examples um, are a little bit more involved. Um, I want to study the derivative of arc sine of x and the derivative of arc tangent of x. Um, so these guys are the inverse functions of sine and tangent respectively. Uh, we'll review those in just a second. Um, let me also say that you can write this as um, of arc sine of x or sine the negative one here of x. Uh, when you write this, um, this does not mean one over. So um, typically, again, if I have a, a square or a cube, I'll put it right here, and it doesn't matter uh, whether I put it here or here. But the negative one here specifically means arc sine, this guy means one over sine. So those guys are two different creatures. So we want to study this guy. So uh, what is arc sine um, all about? Just as a quick review. So um, if y equals um, sine, sorry, y equals arc sine, um, this is the angle between minus pi over two and two whose sine is x. Sounds very Yoda-like to me. Y equals arc sine of x is the angle minus, from minus pi over two to pi over two whose sine is x. I think it's a little bit of a confusing definition, I have to be honest. But let's go through a couple of examples to see what this is all about. So uh, as an example, arc sine of one well, let's see, it's the angle from here to here whose sine is x. So what radian measure between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2 gives us a sine of 1? Uh, as a reminder, you can draw your picture. Um, this is going to be the y-coordinate. So I guess the angle we're looking for is pi over 2. So we're really, we're really just interchanging the inputs and the outputs. Sine of pi over 2 is 1, arc sine of 1 is pi over 2. Um, this is a little curious, the minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, why do we need that uh, restriction? Well, we need that restriction because, um, if you think about it, this isn't the only angle to get me here. I can also zip around once or twice or as many times as I want to get back there. So there are an infinite number of possible answers without the restriction, but we want this to be a function. So um, if we had an infinite number of possible outputs, we would uh, fail the vertical line test miserably. Um, therefore, we restrict our attention to minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. Okay, so that's one example. Uh, another example, arc sine, just to see if we understand this, is arc sine of minus 1. All right, so uh, why don't you pause the video and give that a shot. All right, hopefully you said, okay, minus one's down here. That's the y coordinate. Um, to get there, I can go uh, minus pi over two. I can go backwards by minus pi over two. Again, your answer has to be between minus pi over two and pi over two. 
Okay, so that's um, arc sine. Um, our goal now is to come up with the derivative of arc sine. So we want the derivative of arc sine. So um, again, I want to think of a function whose derivative I know, composed with arc sine, that gives me something else that I know. And since arc sine is the inverse of sine, why don't we use sine? So sine of arc sine um, of x is just x. Those guys are inverses. When you compose them, you get the x back out. I know this is going to work because I know the derivative of sine. And by my process here, I see that I'm going to get an answer out. So let's do it. Um, the derivative of sine of stuff is cosine of stuff um, times the derivative of that stuff. So times the derivative of arc sine, that's what we're looking for. And the right-hand side is just 1. So um, it looks like the derivative of arc sine of x is 1 over cosine of arc sine of x. Now with that said, this is not incorrect, but this is a pretty um, ugly expression. Um, and you may remember from pre-calc that there's a technique that you can use to get rid of cosine of arc, of arc sine of stuff. And the way you get rid of that is by um, drawing a triangle. So let's do that. So um, let's see. We know that arc sine of x Again, that's spitting out an angle, theta. Arc sine spits out an angle. And if that's true, then I guess sine of theta must be x or x over y, because those guys are inverse functions. So sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse. I'm looking for cosine of theta. So I just want adjacent over hypotenuse. So what dead Greek comes to mind? Hopefully you're thinking Pythagoras. So we have um, y squared plus x squared is equal to uh, 1 squared, or just 1. y squared is 1 minus x squared. So I guess this sign is the square root of 1 minus x squared. So this is equal to 1 over um, cosine adjacent over hypotenuse. And that's just 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And that's it. So the derivative of arc sine is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. All right, so uh, let's play a similar game. Come up with the uh, derivative of arc tangent. Um, this is a little bit more difficult, I think, to wrap one's mind around uh, the meaning of arc tangent. Uh, the similarly mysterious definition. This is the angle of minus pi over two, pi over two, whose tangent. Is x. So I think this is trickier because um, now we're looking at ratios of things um, as opposed to uh, with the arc sine, we're just looking where the thing is on the circle. So let's do one example with this. And I know that you can use your calculators to compute these things, but it is nice to think about where they're coming from. Okay, so arc tangent of x is the angle whose tangent is x. So we need to think of some angle that spits out a tangent of 1. Some angle that spits out a tangent of 1. Well, um, tangent is sine over cosine. So to get a 1 out, um, I guess I need uh, that point where both the sine and the cosine are exactly the same. In other words, where the y value is equal to the x value in terms of their coordinates. Well, that's right here. That's right here on the line y equals x. And where does that happen? That happens at pi over 4, halfway between 0 and pi over 2. 
So that's just uh, one example, um, just to uh, wrap our minds around um, the meaning of architangent of x. All right, so let's derive the um, derivative of that guy. Uh, similar matter. So tangent, we know that guy's derivative. Tangent composed with arctangent um, is going to be x because those guys are inverses. So uh, I'm going to give you a minute, pause the video, see if you can find the derivative of arctangent. All right, hopefully you said the derivative of tangent of stuff is secant squared of stuff times the derivative of that stuff, and the derivative of x is 1. So uh, the derivative of a tangent is 1 over secant squared of arctangent of x. All right, so once again, I mean, this is not incorrect, but it's not particularly attractive. Um, let's see if we can play the same game that we played before. So our tangent of x is some angle. Well, if that's true, then I guess tangent of theta is going to spit that x back out. Once again, let's draw a triangle. So tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent. Pause the video, uh, look at what we did in the last um, example, see if you can now clean up secant squared of arctangent of x. Okay, hopefully once again you said, oh, this is Pythagoras, 1 squared plus x squared in square root is going to be uh, this uh, side here. Um, I like to think in terms of cosine instead of secant. Cosine is just 1 over secant. So this is the same thing as 1 over 1 over cosine squared of arc tangent of x. But 1 over uh, 1 over is just cosine squared of arc tangent of x. So I just need to find cosine of the angle and square it. Cosine of the angle is adjacent over hypotenuse. So we have 1 over the square root of 1 plus x squared quantity squared. Squaring top and bottom, we get 1 over 1 plus x squared. So the derivative of arctangent of x is 1 over 1 plus x squared. So we've now derived some pretty um, uh, complicated uh, functions. Um, they're not simplistic in terms of, you know, they're not linear, they're not uh, you know, quadratic, they're a little bit more exotic. And we were able to bypass uh, the limit definition by using this new technique. That's all I have uh, to say for today. I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, today's lecture, and I will see you next time.